ambassador for the David Sweet Foundation. Can you all hear me? Do I need a mic? Is this okay? Okay. Thank you. And uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce the moderator for this afternoon's discussion or panel discussion, Dr. Michael Brake. He is a licensed doctor of physical therapy, a lifelong martial artist, a former amateur fighter, internationally certified fight referee, and a, con and a contributing faculty member at the University of St. Augustine School of Health Science in Dallas, Texas. He founded Strive Wellness LLC in February 2017 and changed the way physical therapy was structured for people with chronic and progressive conditions, empowering people to be better participate in community wellness. In addition to treating individual patients and therapy, he runs group exercise and research programs for people with Parkinson's disease that are steeped in leading evidence from physical therapy and exercise science to help people move and feel better. Outside of patient care research and group programs, Dr. Mike serves as an advisory board member of the East Southwestern Adaptive Sports Coalition. He's a board member and, and, <coughs> and member of the Medical Advisory Board for, for DAP, the Dallas Area Parkinson's Society and is an advocate and presenter for the David Swimme Foundation and the Parkinson's Foundation. For more information, you see a lot of members of Strive Wellness uh, here today doing this, uh, following Mike and uh, as he <coughs> for several years now. Um, for more information, you guys have a website, web, web, www.strivewellness.org. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So without further ado, I would like to pass the mic to Dr. Mike, who will lead the discussion and introduce the panel. everybody. Here we are at another DAPS Keep Moving Symposium. And uh, this one really changed life before the pandemic, which is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and I know everybody's excited because we've got this outstanding panel of experts on the topic of EBS. Uh, so here's, here's how this is going to work. We've got questions. Um, and each of you hopefully has a copy. Questions uh, to to make things a little easier. What I'm thinking <coughs> is this: I'll call on each of you to do a quick introduction and give you a question. Would you like that? So it should be pretty great, and hopefully everybody walks out. Help one more great tool to help people with Parkinson's. So uh, let's get started first. We've got from ClearPoint, Dr. Jessica Williams. And Dr. Williams, can you give us a brief uh, intro and give a general understanding of EBS? Sure. And my understanding. Um, okay, so I'm Dr. Wilden. Uh, I trained at the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine a very long time ago. <laughs> And then I did a fellowship in deep brain stimulation at the University of California, San Francisco in 2012 to 2013. And learned a couple different ways of doing deep brain stimulation in California. And then made the somewhat uh, bizarre decision to come and work in Shreveport, Louisiana for about nine years. Um, we were supported generously by a local healthcare system uh, in Shreveport named Willis Knighton. And uh, we operated from about 2013 up until this last year when our program was closed. Uh, as you know, a lot of the community hospitals were downsizing some resources due to COVID. Uh, but we are trying to encourage people to learn more about ClearPoint and about deep brain stimulation with the thought that hopefully we can expand the technology in Texas in the coming years. So that's a little bit uh, about myself. Um, I am board certified neurosurgeon, but I also did a fair amount of neurology just because that's the nature of the job. When you do deep brain stimulation surgery, you often are involved in some of the management as well. So I've got kind of a pretty broad scope of knowledge about the surgery and certainly about general Parkinson's management as well. Um, and if anyone uh, does have questions for me personally, I do maintain an email to, for outreach and education, simply my last name, md at gmail. So w-i-l-d-e-n-m-d at gmail.com. So on that note, that's a little bit, a bit about me, but let's talk about deep brain stimulation. 
So deep brain stimulation is otherwise known by the lay term, the brain pacemaker. Uh, why do we need a brain pacemaker? Well, because the reason you have the motor symptoms of Parkinson's is because the communication in the brain is not working correctly, right? Our muscles and our bodies only do what instructions our brain is telling them. And what happens in Parkinson's disease and other common related diseases like tremor or dystonia are the brain rhythms get not right. You can think of it sort of as a machine not working well because it doesn't have oil, right? Your dopamine gets low and all of a sudden your brain's not able to grease the wheels as easily. And as a result, the rhythms are not as accurate and not as smooth. So Parkinson's ultimately is a brain arrhythmia, okay? Everyone picking that up? Just like the heart has arrhythmias, Parkinson's is a brain arrhythmia. And because the rhythm is not smooth and giving good instructions to the body, then you get these body symptoms. So I think one of the important things to understand uh, about Parkinson's before trying to understand the role of surgery is that Parkinson's is a brain-based problem, not a muscle problem, and it is a bad rhythm. So now it makes intuitive sense, right, why we would do a pacemaker to help you. So certain rhythms in the brain associated with Parkinson's respond very well to repacing, and that is essentially what the device does, okay? And there are three companies, and I can tell you I implanted all of them in my <laughs> nearly decade-long tenure in the region. So you can ask me the truth, I'll tell you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all the systems uh, can get the job done, and they all have different benefits and um, and certain unique things about them. So the system you use for the brain pacemaker really is dependent more or less on certain personal aspects of yourself. There's not one system that's appropriate for every patient. Um, and so my company that I'm here on behalf of, Clearpoint, just to touch on another quick overview of deep brain stimulation. So just like there are now three systems for deep brain stimulation or the brain pacemaker, there are different ways of performing the pacemaker surgery. One of the most classic ways, as I'm sure anyone here who has DBS or if you've looked at it on the internet, is to wear a metallic head frame and be tested while you're awake to have the device put in. That was a very classic description of the, how the brain pacemaker surgery was developed back in the late 80s. And as a testament to how good it was, it's still used today, that method. And I mean, what other thing are you using now that you used in 87, right? Like, no, not a lot, all right? Uh, maybe your car if you're like me, no. Um, <laughs> which <laughs> these guys will get. I still have a really super old car, just Yes, it's true. Um, so I tell medical students, go into brain pacemaker surgery. You too could still be driving your car from high school. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, and so the awake surgery is good. That's a great option uh, for some people and it has serious staying power. It is still largely in the same design and format that it was first described in, in 87, 88. That being said, in California, we developed and ultimately brought here to this region a way to do the deep brain stimulator placement with the patient under general anesthesia. Because, you know, not everybody wanted awake brain surgery. Some of you, great, and others, not so much. And so, just like clothing or makeup or really any consumer product, there's not one thing that's right for everybody. And so, the Clearpoint system is a way to operate in the MRI to use image-based techniques to get the brain pacemaker into place in an efficient and uh, kind of clean fashion without you needing to be awake and without you needing to take medicine. And its outcomes have been published uh, several times since it was first kind of introduced in about the mid-2000s, and the methods essentially uh, are equivalent whether you're awake or asleep, and that's fairly well established. And then uh, even more methods kind of came out to, to put the brain pacemaker in beyond MRI surgery. Um, people started just using CT 
uh, in the OR with people asleep. So there's a lot of ways, uh, a lot of ways to kind of you know get the surgery done. And I think that's just something really important for Parkinson's patients to understand is that it is your right to be able to shop around, not just for a system, but for a method of putting it in. If you're having a complete panic attack because your particular neurologist, surgeon duo do it a certain way and that's not for you, it is your consumer right to look around and be like, you know what, maybe I'm gonna travel to, to get it placed uh, with a method that I feel more comfortable with. So a couple of, of ways that DBS can be put in and hopefully uh, everyone kind of understands the overarching reason why we use a pacemaker in the first place. Any questions on that front? Well, we've got time for questions at the end. Okay, but so we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> one, one other one that we want to hear from you, Dr. Gilbert. Sure. Is about how many people each year receive DBS annually? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so overall, worldwide, we're probably looking at a couple hundred thousand patients being implanted with DBS. Um, so like I said, it's a very tried and true, very well-established uh, therapy. It is not an end-stage therapy, and it is not an experimental therapy. It is a very well-established therapy, most appropriate for people that actually have moderate, uh, and we're moving even earlier uh, to using it in, um, in just as you start to move from the early to moderate stage uh, is when we're really starting to recommend doing it. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that uh, based in science. But as a result, the annual numbers of people having DBS have gone up. So we used to be looking at about maybe four to 5,000 people implanted per year. And now we're closer to like 10 to 15,000 per year because the criteria have changed slightly as we've learned more about it and in what setting it is best used. So it's a pretty um, well-established and widely used therapy, no matter what method you use to put it in place. Well, thanks for that. And uh, we've got more to ask you later, but mentioned we need to pass the microphone and direct our qu next questions to uh, a representative from Abbott, to Dr. Ryan. And uh, Melissa, could you give us sort of a brief introduction about you and then also with us a little bit about how long Abbott's been around and what makes it different. Sure. So Melissa Ryan, um, I've been working in the medical field for about 18 years. Uh, one of the things I love most is working with patients, and I had the opportunity to come over to Abbott and specialize in DBS um, uh, two years ago, about two years ago. And as far as Abbott, how long they've had um, the Infinity platform. Um, they bought or acquired the St. Jude um, platform in 2016. So that's how long that they've had the DBS platform. And I think the next question was what sets us apart from. So I'm going to just highlight three things that I want to, to focus on. So the first thing is when we did launch and acquire St. Jude, we launched, we were the first to launch directionality. So what that means is that the leads now have segments that you can turn on stimulation, either single segment activation, or you can do the Omni, which is the full ring, or you can just turn on different segments and steer that stimulation to where you're gonna get the most optimal benefit of your therapy, and also steer away where you're getting side effects. So that's one of the things that Abbott did, um, is, is first to launch that, to mar bring that to market. Um, the next thing that we did, um, and Abbott is on the Apple iOS platform, okay? So what we did during the, the pandemic is we launched the Neurosphere Virtual Clinic. What that means is, and what that allows is that patients were allowed to stay connected to their movement disorder specialists virtually. So they could actually can remote connect no matter where the patient is, at home, out of town, um, you know, maybe a caregiver couldn't bring the patient in, but especially during the pandemic when everybody was in lockdown, they could still connect to their doctor and be taken care of and adjust in therapy, get their battery checked, um, talk about medications, maybe do any kind of tweaking they needed to do with their therapy. So that's the other thing that Abbott and only Abbott can offer and provide is the Neurosphere Virtual Clinic platform. And the third thing I really want to highlight in something we actually out, we've got a couple of clinical studies on our longevity of our battery. <clears throat> so it's a recharge-free primary cell, 
and our clinical evidence has shown that our, the average life is 5.6 years. Um, now it's going to be patient dependent, it's also going to depend on the stimulation settings, but again, you get to focus on, as a new patient to DBS, you're focusing on learning about DBS therapy, getting your body adjusted to that therapy, without worrying about the burden of having to recharge the battery that is responsible and takes care of your therapy. So those are really the three things that I wanted to highlight today that kind of separates Abbott uh, in the marketplace. And I think along those lines, you talked about encouraging, but often people will hear about adjustment. Mm -hmm. How frequent is it if a neurologist who is just starting to come to the body to make an adjustment? Very good question. So um, initially, after you're implanted with the full system, Typically, it's about three to four weeks before you'll have your initial programming session, and they call that a monopolar review. And what the neurologist will do, the movement disorder specialist will do, is they map the, the leads, right? So they're going to work their way up the lead and turn on the different segments and find out where the optimal benefit is for therapy. And at the same time, identify where there may be side effects on those leads and steer that stimulation away from that area. So that's the initial programming. Um, once that's completed, they may have you come back in three weeks or so. They want to see, because it, again, it takes some time for your body to get used to stimulation. Um, so once you're optimized, once you've seen this, the neurosurgeon and they say, okay, you've got really good therapy and you're being managed well, it could be three to six months. Um, and again, the goal is to find the right balance of stimulation and the right balance of medication. So typically, a lot of times, once CBS therapy is turned on, you have the ability to bring down those medications that you're on, and you want to find the right balance. Um, and again, with virtual clinic, the ability to check in with your neurologist on a more frequent basis or, or on an as-needed basis is available to do that remotely without having to go into clinic. Thank you, Michael. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. My name's Sean Duncan. I'm with Boston Scientific DBS. Uh, I've been in this area and helped out in the DBS market for almost 17 years. And I was actually affected by Parkinson's many, many years ago. My grandfather had Parkinson's, and in the this was in the 80s. And I saw how getting the right patient to the right place could really another with a solid quality quality of life to be 94 by the way so it was uh, I, I got introduced from Parkinson's a long time ago but I've four amazing kids I've been lucky enough to do this and learn so much from all the experts from the patients from the caregivers and uh, been lucky enough to be with Boston so that is a little bit about me um, as far as uh, Boston the question you want me to go ahead and read it or you want to read it I got it. So basically asking when, when did we start providing DBS? So um, DBS with Boston Scientific started in about 2011, but it was over in Europe. Um, and then Boston brought to the, uh, the neuro community a multiple source system back in the 2003. So it's been around a long time, along with the rechargeable. Um, but in 2011, it was launched over here. We launched, and I was a part of that team in 2017, as far as uh, that goes. And what makes Boston unique? Again, I mentioned the multiple source system. Um, it has the most amount of options for the doctor to manage your stimulation. And you don't know if that's going to matter because uh, even older technology, single source technology that's been around a long time has helped and transformed people's lives. So it's always worked well, but as everybody up here knows, every once in a while, even with an experienced surgeon, you're a little bit on one side or the other, and the ability to shape that field very precisely can impact a patient outcome. Um, you hope it doesn't. You hope you just turn it on and they do amazing, but it didn't always work that way. 
The other innovation was the easy to recharge multiple source battery where it lasts at least 15 years. You don't have to take it out after 15 years. Most patients can go over a month without recharging, but most do about one hour a week with the easy to recharge collar. So it's kind of changed the way surgeons do it because they don't have to go back for as many surgeries, which a lot of patients really like and it's a lot smaller. Um, the other thing is the innovation on programming. Uh, Boston launched image-guided programming earlier in the year with something called StemView XT. It actually shows patient-specific anatomy that the neurosurgeon will use to plan the surgery. It's using the same proprietary software in the programmer itself with a um, CT that's, that was scanned to know exactly which way the lead's facing, which gives the programmer a lot of detail. So with that, you asked the question earlier about programmings. Uh, there's a study done over in Europe, they've had it longer than us, that it minimized the amount of programmings you had to go to and it also optimized the patients much quicker. So the cycle of innovation has been something I've been really lucky, uh, really with all the companies, they're continuing to push each other and uh, that's what makes Boston a little bit different. The last thing. So great question, important question, because uh, we always talk about the risk of doing surgery. I think it's really important to talk with your doctor about the risk of not doing it, because it goes both ways. There's a window of opportunity to get this treatment that can help you for the rest of your life. And things come up in our life that we can't anticipate. When, somebody, when you're a good candidate and it would benefit you and you can safely have it done um, with an expert, um, I am a huge proponent for being your own advocate for that. It's still your choice, but get educated properly. Obviously, being here today is a big part of that. Um, but what we worry most about is any type of bleed or stroke, and the neurosurgeon can definitely talk about this m way better than me. But our, our study done, it shows a one to 2% risk of that, and that's been nationwide for a long time. The risk of something being damaging or permanent is much less than that, and that's important to note, because that's what we're all worried about. Um, with imaging now, they, they take a look at the different vessels. We're not going to a very vascular area of the brain, but it is always still a risk. Infection has always been much higher, 7 to 8 percent nationwide, but now as experts do the surgery more and more, uh, our, st our initial study, which had 196 patients, was at 4 percent. And I think most of us can say our neurosurgeons are even below that. So um, I hope that helps. So those are the two main ones that we worry most about. All right, I'm Paul LaBeouf, I uh, work for Medtronic, <coughs> as he stated. Uh, I've been in the medical field for about 25 years as a rep, worked in neurosurgery for about 15 years, and I've been dedicated to the DDS space about 10 years. So, uh, seen a lot, um, seen a lot of advancements. Medtronic um, basically came to fame, we invented the pacemaker. So you think about cardiac uh, procedures back in the 50s, we were the first company to bring that to market. Um, and then we took that technology and that revenue and developed neurostimulators, which is what has created this whole field that we're all a part of right now. Um, so we were involved in the investigational stuff in the 80s. Uh, in the 90s, we got first FDA approval for our first indication for essential tremor in 1998, Parkinson's in 2001. Um, we have an HDE um, exemption for dystonia, which was in 2003, which is a muscle contraction disorder. Um, we have some uh, indications for OCD, for Tourette's. Um, our most recent indication was for epilepsy in 2018. So all the targets and all the indications that we currently have in this field were pioneered by Medtronic. Right? We did the development and we brought all this to market. Um, we have uh, implanted over 185,000 patients worldwide just in our, our company. Um, and of course that's growing every year. Um, we've had everything from the start to the new technology now. We have directional leads as well. 
we have rechargeable batteries. We have non-rechargeable batteries. Um, I think we probably have the l most diverse portfolio that's out there. Um, and we just have kind of a different focus. And we've kind of done um, the visual programming where you program a patient and you watch a patient for visual cues, but we're ushering in a new type of technology. Um, just as if you would go to a cardiologist, you'd want an EKG. You'd want some kind of a, a reference of what's happening with your heart, you know, some kind of a, a reading script so you can see how it's performing. We look at the brain the same way. Our new leads and our new um, the battery platform is listening to a patient's LFPs, which are local field potentials. Those are biomarkers for the, your disease state. And all that means is, is that with the older technology, we program, we watch you, and we try to program it based on what we see. We still do that, but we also now have collective data that we're getting from the brain um, that identifies in your specific disease state what symptoms you have. And then we have, um, we adjust our programming based on that. Uh, we also have a lot of partnerships uh, within uh, the healthcare. Um, most DBS patients that go through with surgery, your surgery is going to be planned on a device that Medtronic designed or, or made. Um, a lot of the equipment that's in the OR has been designed by Medtronic. Um, and so we're, we're involved in a lot of the DBS aspect of what you do. Um, and like I said, we've got some really exciting things that are just uh, on the cusp of coming out. Um, and so to continue to watch us and check back in soon. Okay. Just uh, kidding. Yeah. Oh, just kidding. Yeah. You. Eric, really quick, because I are on a time frame, but um, I like the corporations because <laughs> you get these buzzwords where you're like nodding. You're like, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. But in your mind, you're like, like, what? What did they mean by that? So let me just. And there are three things I want to address really quick. Um, so. <laughs> First for Abbott, directionality. What, what do we mean by that? So traditionally, DBS could only be delivered as a sphere, okay? But your structures in your brain are not all spherical. They're different shapes. Directionality is simply a terminology that we use in the field to explain that we can now deliver stimulation to your brain in a non-spherical shape to more closely match your anatomy, okay? Uh, moving on, what is multi-directional uh, current? Okay, um, what Sean's talking about is the Boston system can use different frequencies in different areas. It allows us to do some pretty high level programming because not all your symptoms will respond to the same frequency or same uh, programming. So if you need different programming in the same area for the different pathways that intersect that area, that is one of the benefits of Boston's technology, okay? Um, and then Paul, uh, LFP, okay. All Paul is saying is that um, we are now mapping for the neurologist color-coded brain arrhythmias to give feedback about how the DBS is doing to fix those arrhythmias. And that is what Medtronic's new system is able to print out and show neurology, is it's able to get information in a color-coded manner um, on brain arrhythmias and how they're responding to the tech. Is that, for the three of you, is that a fair patient uh, explanation of some of the <laughs> corporate terms there? Um, so you can see each system has significant uh, benefit, but just in case we didn't all, because I know, you know, you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it, but, but Sometimes you don't totally get it, and it's important to understand the really basic concepts behind what each company uh, can do. Um, and then we missed a question. What percentage of people that have DBS are helped uh, versus who are not helped at, at all? Yeah, whoa, great question. And I, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, address it. Um, yeah, so <laughs> bottom line, you are the most important factor for DBS. None of us matter compared to how you matter. What do I mean by that? Your brain's health, your brain's health is the biggest predictor of how DBS is going to work for you. I can place it, and they can program it, and we can do all the fancy tech in the world. But if you are not eating correctly, if you are not exercising, if you are not taking care of yourself and making your brain health a massive priority 
Maybe you have to leave your job. Maybe you have to change your life. Maybe you have to move or get away from family who is not supportive of your exercise or your choices. But you have got to live a life that works for you and your brain health or nothing that we offer will be a quick fix for you. And I think that gets to the real core of that question. In people where DBS does not end up working well, it is people that have otherwise, in general, not been able, for whatever reason, to live a life that works for their brain health and they're suffering from cognitive trouble, lack of exercise, lack of, of you know, nu proper nutrition and support, social support, and in those settings, DBS can do something, but it can't do everything. And I think that that's a very classic way to describe DBS is that good patients do good and bad patients do bad. Okay, so remember, if you're considering DBS, you are the most important factor. So take care of yourself and live a life that works for you, even if you've got to make dramatic changes, because gosh, you're thinking about brain surgery, so you might as well go all in and live a life that works for you and your brain. So that's just, I think, you know, in general, I'd say more than 80% of people get what they're hoping for out of DBS, but you know, for people that are hoping it'll be 100% quick fix, but you're not doing all these other things to be a partner, it, it doesn't work like that, okay? So live a life that works for you and you are much more likely to benefit significantly from DBS. Um, yeah. can miss your window. Yeah. yeah, that's basically what Sean is saying. Can you it is not an end stage therapy. Your brain's got to be healthy enough to retraining it to fire better. Uh, so it's the more diseased you let it get, the harder it is to retrain, right? I always used to tell my patients, uh, your brain like a small child, right? Like if I discipline it early on in the course, we're in good shape. If I let the, the brain just totally run out of control and your bad rhythms are just going crazy for years and years and years, um, it is much harder to rein it back in and get it to fire correctly. So typically you are eligible to add DBS to your toolbox to fight Parkinson's diagnosis of at least four years, okay? Medical complications like wearing off or residual tremor for about 16 weeks. And after that, you are eligible for DBS. So don't let someone put you off. Again, it is your right to find a provider that will listen to your concerns and take you seriously if you think you're ready, okay? Or at least ready to start discussing it. If your neurologist is not ready, then that's on them, not on you. It is your right, once you meet the criteria, to start to investigate your ability to get it. Um, to get back to our wire implants, because now I know I'm over time, but we've addressed some of the other questions, I think, in the interim. but. This is an important one for you guys to understand for your own advocacy. Are the brain wires and the battery placed in the same surgery? No, in most places, because the hospital does not get paid for the battery if you do it that way. So most hospitals will have a setup that you have to have the brain leads placed in one surgery and you have to come back some weeks later to get the battery because that's how they maximize profit on fee for service. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I know, this question always blows people away, right? Here's the kicker though. Most doctors are pretty decent and willing to take the hospital on. So if you are in the know and you say, hey, I know that the usual is that you stage this, but for me and my logistics, I want it all in one setting, most doctors will capitulate that to you and they'll just eat it from the hospital, okay? So you need to ask though. Otherwise, you will be put into the uh, kind of train where you get to come back like two or three different times. So, uh, and, and that is just the world we live in, okay? Now, eventually we may go to value-based care where we are reimbursed for doing the right thing for you, 
uh, but we're not there yet. We are on a fee-for-service model, which means the more services they provide to you in however many staged surgeries, the more the hospital makes. So you just need to be aware of that. And most situations, a doctor will allow you to have it placed all in once if you aggressively ask for that for yourself, okay? Uh, yeah, so no. I mean, the bottom line is, yes, they pay for it, but they do not pay enough if you do it all in one hospital stay to cover the cost of buying the battery, the hospital from the corporate entities. So that's why most hospitals will say, oh gosh, I don't want to take a loss on the battery. Come back and do it as an outpatient, right? Because then they're paid under a different model such that they get paid a lot more and can cover the cost of the battery. And I mean, before we start hating on hospitals, I'm just gonna throw it out there. If you do a little research, most American hospitals are operating at a negative margin. And I think it is important to understand that. There's no like good guy or bad guy. The system's just very complicated and there's a lot of working parts. And so it just is what it is. But you just need to be aware of that so you can ask, you know, um, hey, I, I would rather have the whole thing implanted at once. That's really best for me and my family. And Medicare will cover it, not to the degree that the hospital wants, but, but they do, Medicare doesn't really see a difference, right? Wh however you have it, it's the hospital driving that. Dude, don't advertise that. You want them to stay around? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> and they're also going out of business. No, I'm just Check with me later. Well, that's <laughs> inappropriate to advertise. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. move forward and, yeah, and, yeah. and just before we start jumping into a whole bunch of questions from your group, which is great because we've got a lively crowd. <laughs> We're stimulated. Uh, but maybe, Melissa, <laughs> can you share with us a little bit about who is an ideal candidate for EDF? Share. Sure. I mean, Dr. Wilden did did touch on that, but I think number one, make sure there's no significant cognitive impairment. Um, she mentioned having idiopathic Parkinson's with symptoms for at least four years. Um, make sure you're a good candidate just for surgery, right? You want to make sure you're clear to even have surgery in the first place. Um, and that you're still getting benefit from medications, that you're still having some symptoms relieved by medications. Um, so those are really the top four things. Um, DBS is not for everyone. Not everyone is going to be a candidate and it is not a cure. So there is a window which we talked about a little bit earlier and that window as PD progresses will close. So the discussion, um, you know, I'm always saying knowledge is power and, you know, this is your life, do your due diligence. So um, very important to talk to your movement disorder specialist. Um, there's a few hoops to jump through to make sure it can safely be done. And most movement disorder that are familiar with it, that would be my biggest recommendation. Somebody that does this all the time. And we have tons of experts. You heard one of them with Dr. Elkard today. Um, there's many, many more. There's more now than any time that I've done this job, you know, to get help with experts. It's pretty, pretty cool. T it's a great time to be a Parkinson's patient in this Metroplex. There's so many you know, valuable tools. With that being said, um, neuropsych evaluation, cognitive is very important for all patients, even if the doctor doesn't have concerns, because depression runs right along with uh, dopamine levels and Parkinson's, so they wanna make sure everybody is managed well and in a good spot. Um, and it gives a really nice uh, mark of where they are that they can refer back many years later. So it's a very powerful tool for that. Also, for most uh, doctors will do on-off testing and it, you get off your medicine, um, you go into the clinic, off medicine, bring your medicine with you and you do, so they'll test you. UPDRS is a testing that's very standard that they do. Um, they'll score you and then they'll let you take your medicine, let it kick in and then they score you when that's done. 
Um, so that's the two hoops that doctors uh, or patients have to go through to get to referred to a neurosurgeon. Then the neurosurgeon, to Melissa's point, does the surgical candidate, you know, make sure your expectations are good. So they, they'll definitely check in with that and make sure they can safely do the surgery, which, you know, we just did a surgery, patients do. Uh, it, it changes a little bit with comorbidities, you know, patients with pacemakers, with other, you know, diabetes, other things, we can safely do the surgery, but there's important factors that the surgeon will go over. So those are kind of the two main, um, main things along with that, then the surgeon will do an MRI and set you up for surgery. So, yep. Certainly. Uh, I want to touch on one quick point that Sean um, was talking about is just also meeting with the company representatives. Patient education is a huge component to this. Um, it's now, I think, pretty common that most neurologists in the area will use any one of the three companies. Um, you take it upon yourself to come and meet with the company representative. We'll bring the products. We'll lay it all out. We'll talk to you about what they do, what they don't do. And you're more informed, and you make the decision. Your own patient advocate has, has been stated multiple times. And if you feel you know, a relationship with that, that, that product line or that individual um, that's going to be there, um, you, know, you need to be in charge of, of your decision process. Um, and back to the main question, just the, the benefits long term. I think we know that um, as long as medications are helpful and you get implanted with DBS, it's going to complement what you currently have is on time. And what it will do is it will extend the utility of those medications longer. So there was a recent study out where they had patients that were on normal medication regimen and then patients that had medications in DBS. And the patients that had the DBS were faring better in their scores than patients that did not. To what degree, we don't know. Every patient is individual. But as long as the meds are working and we get, most importantly, get you know, the, the components in the right place, and you get a positive effect, it will help you long term. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm going to just follow that up. The, uh, the biggest question we get is, does it keep working? And the answer is yes. It always continues to work the amount it helps. Does the disease progress sometimes past what it can cover? The answer is yes. So that's understandable. So most of our patients implanted 5, 10, 15 years, if you shut them off, they would be non-functional. With the device, are they perfect? Absolutely not. But are they still getting that original core benefit from, and you know, there's been a 10-year study done, but I think in this area, we've seen it, you know, much longer than 10 years continue to benefit because most patients can shut it off. And if they do, they can see, even with medication, that difference, so.
of things like maybe Eliquis or Xarelto, Coumadin that might be um, recommended after you've had a stroke. Uh, those blood thinners, because we, hence the name, right, we are in the deep brain. It's not just on the surface. Because of that, we do stop blood thinners for the brain part of the surgery. And if your cardiologist or your neurologist for the stroke decides it's too early to stop those, you need to stay on them for a minimum of a year, that would be kind of the determining factor is when could you come off a blood thinner. But I think beyond any of that, um, no, I think you're still a good candidate. It just, um, you can see, right, that surgery will knock you down a notch, so you want to be in the best shape you can be before it. Although, in general, and I'm sure these guys could probably comment too, my experience, because I had many DBS patients that also had an orthopedic surgery, um, DBS tended to be a little lighter than the knee replacement, the hip replacement, so just, yes. <laughs> yeah, those can be some tough ones. So don't don't assume the DBS will be the equivalent of the knee. I don't think that's gonna be the case, yeah. Um, but great question, and that, that is a common problem is COVID and stroke, so get your booster. So statins can cause muscle pain in just normal population that we might see, you know, anyone with back pain or high cholesterol or whatever. But in Parkinson's, because your muscles already, so actually let's backtrack even further. In Parkinson's, your actual muscle recruitment and your strength gets a little impaired, okay? Hence the importance of working out because you're trying to build that muscle and build that strength because you are already losing more of it than you would from aging alone. Parkinson's, in essence, makes you a little weak, okay? Well, now you add a medicine whose side effects can include muscle weakness. You can see that for many Parkinson's patients, using a statin is just not feasible or you have to alter the dose for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends on, it, I mean, it just depends. You know, it might be a, just a, a discussion because everything in medicine, there's no black and white. Yeah, if you talk to whoever's prescribing it and say, you know, do you think stopping this or reducing it might lead to better motor function? I mean, it certainly wouldn't hurt, you know, but you don't ever want to stop something because they might tell you, well, gosh, with your particular cholesterol problem, this could be fatal, you know, so I, I think it just kind of depends on the risk and benefit. Yeah, good question. No, symptoms for four years, because at least where I was in practice, people would assume that you'd be diagnosed when you developed symptoms. And unfortunately, yeah. right, unfortunately yeah. in the rural communities in particular surrounding Dallas-Fort Worth, I think all of us have seen that patients get diagnosed way delayed. Um, and so, yeah, no, we would generally say Parkinson's from when you started to experience it in, in your yeah. telling of it. Yes, yes. Yeah, they have had Parkinson's symptoms since X, right? And then, you know, that has to be the four-year period. At least that's how I, I would yeah. get it approved. Is that a fair? Right. 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 But, yes, for insurance approval, because, you know, I, I did all that uh, running a private clinic <laughs> myself, too. Uh, yes, so that's what I would do. If you were diagnosed in the last year, but we thought you were an appropriate DBS candidate because you'd had symptoms for six years and you were pretty advanced, then we would state your diagnosis from six years ago in the record. Yeah, you just need to make sure your doctor's documenting that you know, if you're looking at potentially moving to DBS earlier in a diagnosis, but you've had symptoms, you just need to have it in the record that you've had Parkinson's symptoms for longer than four years. So it's largely a documentation thing. Yeah, it can be, it, it's a constellation. So it's really doctor's judgment. I usually would date it from when someone first started noticing some type of, of motor impairment. And I'm sorry, you had a question, yeah.
Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, listen, great question, right? Like, there's no, first, what I would say is the gap can be covered by the company, and these companies are large, so I will say I've worked with everyone here. They're not doctors, but gosh, they're close. Um, like, for me personally, I've been in the OR with Paul and Sean, um, and I'm sure Abbott has the same experience. They have a huge amount of experience that verges on what most fellows in movement disorders have. Um, they don't necessarily carry the title, but their knowledge runs very deep and often spans decades. So in the event your doctor or surgeon were to leave and you didn't have follow-up for a window, the company should be able to bridge that gap in most major cities. And there are significant experts at every company in most major cities. Uh, but you touch on a really big problem, right? My own clinic was just shut down by the hospital for financial reasons, and I was one of the centers that put the whole device in at one time. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying, go easy on that, guys. If you can come back as an outpatient, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> but because that's a very real concern, right? And then they moved it all back to the county, but you can imagine that was a bit of a different experience in Louisiana, going to the same hospital treating the gunshots as for your DBS was maybe not the same experience as going to a movement <laughs> disorder clinic. So I, I just think that uh, it is a problem. Um, the most you can do is advocate for, and now is a good time to advocate for better Parkinson's care, better reimbursement of the multidisciplinary clinic. Um, and why is now a good time? Because there's a bill in Congress about with the specific goal to increase access to specialized clinics and specialized care for Parkinson's. It's being sponsored in part by Michael J. Fox and it is in Congress right now. So if you go to the Michael J. Fox website and just par type in Parkinson's bill, you'll get the info on it. DAPS has priority provided you the info, but what you may not know about that bill is part of its stated purpose is to address this issue of poor reimbursement for movement disorders, of disjointed care, of DBS being difficult to get and maintain, um, including different methods of having it placed. And so, you know, you go to your representatives and you, you email them and you say, I want better support for the multidisciplinary movement disorder clinic. I want better reimbursement for DBS so that our surgeons stay and don't have to keep chasing spine surgery to make a living and pay off their debt. You know, I think you, you guys have to advocate that we want these things um, and it will slowly change. But to answer the direct practical question, what happens if you get DBS and someone moves or leaves? The answer is the company has experience that spans decades that's very good. And the company should be able to fill in the gap at least for a period of time while matching you with someone else. Is there something you can point to in the Exactly, what do you mean? I mean, you know, people come up to us and they'll say, so you want us? We get it. No, there's no, there's no control. No, it, it's, it's, all, it's all separate, but I would just say this. Uh, there has been changes in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I would say with the experience and knowledge of people who have stayed and been very static for a very long time, along with some of the new experts that have come to town, it would be very unnecessary to leave the Dallas-Fort Worth area for anything to do with DBS. You know, you have that choice, you have that option all the time. But if my grandfather was having it done, you know, I would, uh, you know, send him this way in a heartbeat because they're experts. That's what you want. You want experts. Dallas you want is a destination site. We have a lot of patients. They come in from all over. And Alice County. And then uh, to your point, what really happens is insurance changes as well. You leave without a provider. It's not typically because we have our providers are leaving. They shuffle. They move around, but they're still in the metroplex. The biggest issue I think that we deal with is just if your insurance changes, 
and you no longer can go to that doctor, then we've got to find you somewhere else that's on a plan for you. And that's that's our role. That's where we step in and we'll help you out. Thank you. Do we get the same thing? Do I get yeah. to, is this a Chinese exchange? <laughs> Can I take his and you? Supply chain problem. Oh, gotcha. Supply chain management. We got an extra. I'm a 2X, okay? This is not funny. <laughs> <laughs>